He'll never come back. He wasn't that funny anyway. His jokes are dumb. He doesn't know how to light a set. Etc. 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 Kev. Kev, wake up. What? 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 Are you okay? Yeah. Sorry. She's having a nightmare. It was Tuesday and I'd forgotten to record a video and people were angry with me. Oh, um... Kev, it is Tuesday. Oh, shit! I gotta go! I gotta set up! I gotta set up! I gotta set up! I gotta set up! Oh, no! I don't even read the chapter. I don't know what I'm gonna talk about. I don't have anything. That's what I'm gonna do. It's not working. <laughs> Why did I get a haircut the day I was going to film? It's not working. Hey, come here. You got this. Okay. Okay. Shoes. I need shoes. I don't. Do I wear shoes while I do this? I don't even remember. It's been three months. Hi. Hi. Season four. It's. Happy Tuesday, Potterheads! I am honestly so happy to be back working on the book club again. It was good and necessary for me to be able to take some time to do something different, but I am just so happy to be back. First and foremost, I do just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your patience and for your understanding while I was away for these last three months. Getting to do Puffs was honestly one of the great joys of my life. Not only because it's such a well-written show, but also because all of the insanely talented people that I got to work with in this cast, all my puffs, are now truly like a new family that I belong to. So thank you all for the gift of your patience and understanding and kind words while I got to go live the dream and pretend to be a wizard for two hours every night. But now we're here! It's season four of the book club and like, holy sh you guys, how did we get to book four already? We're like almost halfway through the book. I mean, like, not halfway through the books by, like, number of pages or anything. The bulk of the series is still ahead of us. Oh god. How am I gonna come up with so many topics for Order of the Phoenix? Panic! But today we are kicking off season four by talking about chapter one of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and how J.K. Rowling has layered some pretty interesting parallels with another chapter in the series. But before we jump into it, go ahead and read that recap in the description below. And if you're new here, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell so you always know when I upload. And if you need to catch up on any of the seasons of the book club, you can just click that card in the top left right there. And one other update, I am now repping a non-Harry Potter, non-fandom, but still semi-book culture related subscription box called Sips Buy. This box is a monthly subscription box that delivers a selection of teas right to your door. And they make their selections based on a quiz that is used to gauge what kind of teas you might be interested in, and then they send those teas to you. And they work with companies from all over the world, so you'll get teas that you definitely won't find in your local grocery store. I have received two boxes so far, and since I'm a bit of a slacker and was taking time off, I haven't done anything with them yet. But so far, for real, you guys, this box is pretty cool. Whether you're a seasoned tea veteran looking for some new teas to try, or if you're completely brand new and have no idea what tea even is, this box is a really cool way to achieve both of those goals. If you want to try out Sips Buy, just visit the link in the description below and use my code KEVIN5, that's K-E-V-I-N, the number 5, to get $5 off your first box. Okay, first I want to say that I think this chapter might be one of the best first chapters in all of the books. I mean, sure, there's nothing like revisiting that class classic first line of the first chapter of the first book, but beyond the nostalgia factor, this chapter is so good! It starts out pretty mysteriously, not giving you any sort of background establishing information to catch you up. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the name Riddle hasn't been mentioned since the second book. So like, if you didn't go back and read book two before picking this one up, you'd be completely in the dark. Arts, that is. Nope. Bad pun. Didn't work. Season 4! Even still, sometimes I misremember the details of this chapter and have to remind myself what generation of riddles we're talking about. But I love this chapter so much because by this time, J.K. Rowling has really mastered her ability to kind of build a lot of tension in a short amount of space. Just reading these 15-ish pages that I've read so many times before, I was still feeling the tension and the anxiety building up and my heart starting to race. Like, it's just such a well-written chapter. Like, just from a purely casual reader standpoint, it's freaking awesome! What I love 
love looking at this chapter, though, from our normal HP nerd zoomed out perspective, is how it mirrors and parallels the first chapter of the first book. First off, interestingly, this is the first time that we start off somewhere totally unfamiliar since that first book. We're given no information that's necessary to understand what's going on. We're just being told a story. We aren't starting off with another boring recap like in books two and three, and thank God we aren't starting at the Dursleys again. Additionally, just like that first chapter in Sorcerer's Stone, the first chapter of Goblet of Fire follows the beginning of this story from the perspective of a muggle, particularly one muggle whose life would become completely transformed from what he thought it would be because of magic. Just like we follow Uncle Vernon on the day that magic changed his life, in this chapter we get to follow Frank and see how magic is changing his. Granted, we come to learn that the magic surrounding Frank's life was a little bit more evil, so he meets a less savory end, but still. And I think J.K. Rowling is mirroring that very first chapter for two reasons, and they kind blew my mind when I thought of them, so hold on, guys. First, this complete tonal and structural shift from the first few books is her way of telling us to get ready because shit's gonna get real. Like, she starts off the first book with a lot of whimsy and celebration and confusion, but general happiness and hope. This book, she's like, okay, kids, here's the deal. You're like 14 years old now, so you're gonna have to deal with some serious trauma for the rest of this series, and it starts now. Because, like, nothing else really major happens in those other first chapters, except for Harry's delivery to the Dursleys, which only comes at the very end. But here, by the end of this chapter, we have learned about and or seen no fewer than five deaths. Oldest Riddle 1, Oldest Riddle 2, Tom Riddle Sr., Bertha Jorkins, and Frank Bryce. Five deaths, all in one chapter. Shit's gonna go down, kids. We all should have seen the end of this book coming. She showed us from the very beginning that she no longer cares about our happiness. Cedric! It's so much harder to deal with that now that I've been a puff for three months. Okay, and the second thing I think J.K. Rowling is trying to do with the mirroring of these first chapters is kind of even cooler. So the first chapter of the first book is kind of like Harry's door was opened onto his big adventure. Like, not his entry back into the wizarding world, but that first chapter is kind of where the meat of Harry's story begins. And the way I see it, Goblet of Fire is kind of Voldemort's version of that new beginning. Yes, we've seen bits and pieces of him in other books. Book one, he's inhabiting Quirrell. Book two, we see a bit of his soul fragment trying to take hold. Book three, Voldemort can't be bothered to show up, and so he leaves it all to Wormtail, the worst servant in the world. But Goblet of Fire is where we see Voldemort making his full return and really start making an impact on the wizarding world again. So we have these two parallel chapters, each mirroring each other in their narrative perspective and each kicking off the beginning of our two main characters intense stories. Add the mystery to it all and ooh, chills. I just freaking love this chapter so much. And that's all for today's topic, you guys. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Is this chapter also one of your favorites like it is for me? Or what else do you think about it? Let me know. So Prisoner of Azkaban ends with a lot of unanswered questions, right? So one other thing that I wanted to talk about that isn't very meaty, but I did want to bring up is that I am so glad that we get a few answers right away with this chapter. Like we're given an answer to where Wormtail went off to after he escapes in book three pretty much right away. So we don't have to spend a lot of time wondering where that greasy little f***er went. And also, like, we're given some confirmation of Trelawney's abilities as a seer because of that. She was right! The servant was reunited with the master! The prophecy is true! There are so many things that we are still left with no answer to about this story and this universe, so it's just kind of nice to get some answers when you get them. Now, someone remind me what the fuck was up with Bertha the Jorkins because I'm too lazy to do the research myself right now! And all right, this week's fun question, first one of the season, and yes, after I wrote this question, the answer was revealed to me. But still, come up with creative answers to how the hell do you milk a snake? other than it's Venom. <laughs> and that is it for this week's video. If you like the video so much, please give it a thumbs up and share it with all of your friends. And if you really like what I'm doing, you can subscribe and ring the notification bell. And if you really love being a part of this community, there are ways that you can support me in the description via my Patreon and my merchandise. And you guys, seriously, thank you again for sticking with me while I got to go off and do puffs. It brought so much more happiness and light and love into my life than I ever could have expected. So I am really honestly truly grateful that you guys stuck with me through these three months of YouTube silence. And actually somehow as of today recording I ended up like seven subscribers up from where I was when I left so that's cool. The YouTube algorithm can fuck right off, but seriously, thank you. And to any of my puffs who might be watching, I love you all. And lastly, of course, I have said this so many times and I will continue to say it so many more times. 
Thank you to my incredible partner in all things, Jess, and to my wonderfully silly and resilient daughter, Margo. You two gave me the greatest gift of all by allowing me to go off and be silly by myself without you for two hours every night. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you both more than anything. If you need to catch up on any of the seasons of the book club, just click right here. And if you want to watch any of my parody videos, click right there. Your assignment for next week is to read chapter two. That's The Scar. So make sure you read that by next Tuesday. And until then, happy reading. <sighs> It's so good to be back. Knox!